G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to War Thunder with Mags. So today we're dusting off an old relic that has been sitting around in the back of my hangar for the last five years. This is the R2Y2 V2. And yes, the last time I flew this thing was somewhere around early 2015 in patch 1.45, not long after I did a review video on it. What you're watching here is the first time flying this thing since then. Now I want to do something a little bit different today, something that I have not done in a long time. Let's talk about the R2-Y2 and what the hell it is, because it is a bit of an interesting aircraft. It's both a real aircraft, a paper plane, and a fantasy design, all at the same time. So the real aircraft was the R2-Y1, which was envisioned as a high-altitude, single-prop, unarmed reconnaissance plane, powered by a HA-7001 3,400 horsepower V-12. The engine was based on the Daimler Benz 606. Now, it fed its power into a large diameter six-bladed prop, and it was originally designed in 1941, but a series of setbacks delayed the prototype's first flight until the 8th of May 1945. The test pilot for the design was Lieutenant Commander Kitajima, and the test flight took place from the Kizarazu Naval Air Station at Yokosuka. And the test flight had troubles from the moment of takeoff. Starting on the ground, Kitajima noted odd vibrations running through the entire aircraft during taxi that began to increase as the aircraft made its run down the runway, took off, and began its climb. Now the aircraft's climb performance was poor, its speed was unremarkable at the time, however testing was limited as the vibrations began to become so violent that Kitajima feared it may shake apart the airframe. He recognised that the issue was either an instability or an imbalance in the design of either the propeller or the drive shaft, so Kitajima manually disconnected the drive shaft from the engine in mid-flight, allowing it to free spin. The vibrations ended immediately. He managed to land the R2-Y1 prototype dead stick safely back at Kizarazu Naval Air Station where it was towed off to a development hangar to be analysed. And that is pretty much where the story ends. An allied bombing raid targeting military facilities around Yokosuka destroyed the hangar keeping the R2-Y1 prototype, the rigs used in its construction and most of the design, manufacturing and construction documents completely just a few days later. So where does the R2-Y2 come from then? Well. This is where the paper comes in. In 1945, Japan was experimenting with jet aircraft using technology acquired from the Germans, in particular parts of the ME-262 and other jet and rocket projects that were delivered to Japan via U-boat. An unknown designer did do a series of designs that are genuine, showing the R2Y1 airframe equipped with a solid nose and carrying two Japanese NE-330 jet engines an engine derived from the BMW 003 used in the HE 162, slung under the wings in nacelles, very similar in design to the ME 262's engine nacelles. The design also included 30mm cannons and a provisional space for bomb mounts. That however is it, just the paper design existed, it was never built and it was never tested. The NE 330 engine did exist in a prototype form but never advanced to a production stage or even a reliable prototype stage and the war coming to an end cut short any more development of the concept. Which leaves the V2 which I'm flying in these battles and the V3 in question. And this is where stuff gets interesting, see there are no known confirmed genuine designs for either of these aircraft anywhere. A book published in 2009 called The Japanese Secret Projects No. 1 Experimental Aircraft of the Imperial Japanese Army and Imperial Japanese Navy 1939-1945 shows designs for both aircraft, designs that are identical to the V2 and V3 we see in game down to the paint job, but neither design is sourced, only the V1. There are some mentions of the designs in older books as well, but no detailed drawings. Without a confirmed design for either the V2 or the V3, it's best to consider both these aircraft as fantasy designs. However, they are rather good fantasy designs, including information that only someone that had seen some of the surviving documents for the R2Y1 would know. Now, this is where we break into the realms of theory and hearsay. One story I did come across regarding the V2 and the V3 designs, and this is for the record just an unconfirmed story presented by somebody looking to give some authenticity to the designs, was that perhaps at some point after the war ended and new jet technology emerged, someone who worked on the design team for the original R2Y1 that was involved in the R2Y2 jet concept and that survived the war 
scratched out a couple of new versions of the aircraft based on emerging technologies, and these found their way into the research materials of future writers looking to cover the development of Japanese jet technology in the Second World War. Which is why the V-2 carries fuselage-mounted engines similar to late 1940s and early 1950s US naval jet fighters, and why the V-3 has the open nose intake that would become a prominent feature on fighters such as the F-86 Sabre and the MiG-15 during the Korean War. It is, however, more likely that these are completely fabricated whole cloth by authors looking for material to make Japan seem more menacing towards the end of the war. And the concepts have been reiterated and redeveloped with each retelling until they popped up here in War Thunder. In either case, neither the V2 or the V3 is a genuine design from the Second World War, either in construction or in paper, with the only real truth between all of the designs being the fuselage shape of the prototype reconnaissance fighter that flew exactly once before being obliterated. So once again, a real design, a paper design, and a fantasy design all at once. Now, whenever you discuss the R2-Y2 in context of War Thunder, it always leads to a discussion as to whether or not it should be included in the trees at all. Back in 2015, when it was introduced, the argument for keeping it was that at the time, Japan had very few native jet designs and almost no top-tier aircraft, as unlike Germany, Japan's jet development lagged behind the rest of the world at the end of the war by a significant margin, and post-war Japan's military rearmament was tightly controlled and limited by the United States, allowing just the formation of the Japanese Self-Defense Force. Since then, Gaijin have pushed the timelines for aircraft along quite a bit, and newer, more modern designs have found their way into the trees, which kind of nullifies that argument. I personally, however, still don't think that they should be removed. First, they've been in the game for five, almost six years at this point. Any damage that they could do has already been done. Players have them unlocked, and as we know, Gaijin never removes vehicles from players who already have them they only remove the ability for new players to unlock them, so no matter what, the R2-Y2 will continue to show up in War Thunder Skies. But more than that, in 2015 one could at least argue that Gaijin was trying to make the game seem realistic. In the realistic battle modes back then, the battles were limited to only nation versus nation, or at worst, faction versus faction engagements. Mixed teams was never a thing outside of arcade game modes. And these battles would take place on maps that again, at least tried to represent locations where real battles took place, even if the nations involved in the match didn't fight there. These days, most battles consist of mixed teams of allied and Axis aircraft, with faction battles being relatively rare, and I cannot recall the last time I actually fought in a nation versus nation engagement. And what you get is situations like this. World War II era jets dogfighting each other over modern looking cities that don't seem to represent any real location in the world other than generic modern city. I think the realism bird has long escaped the cage at this point. And I would extend this out to most of the other questionable vehicles that float around in War Thunder as well. The damage has been done at this point. Let's just try and have a little bit of fun. Anyways, ladies and gents, hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching. I will be starting to do more videos like this in the future, going over some of the various aircraft. In fact, I'm working out an entirely new format for it. I'm not entirely sure what this format is going to look like just yet. I, uh, I've only just got off exam, so I need a little bit more time to work this one out. But um, I'm hoping to have the first of these up in the next coming weeks. Anyways, again, hope you enjoyed this one, and as always, take care.